On this episode of the Catholic Echo Podcast from the Diocese of Youngstown, we're talking about ecumenism and working for Christian unity with Bishop David Bonner, Justin Hike, and Father Joe Whitmer. Find more about this episode's topic, including articles from the Catholic Echo, at catholicecho.org slash podcast. And now the host of the Catholic Echo Podcast, Father Jim Corda. Hello and welcome to the Catholic Echo Podcast. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Our show is brought to you by the annual Dossesan Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and Cumulus Media Youngstown. Joining me again is Bishop David Bonner of the Diocese of Youngstown. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Father Corda. We are beginning this week what we call the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. It really is a long time standing, going back to the early 1900s, uh, celebrating and encouraging camaraderie and the sharing of faith, evangelization, ecumenism, interfaith activities with our sisters and brothers in the Christian community, in the Orthodox, but also in the Jewish community. But we're going to focus on ecumenism, our Christian brothers and sisters. Why is it important for us to be receptive and open and respectful of our Christian brothers and sisters? Together we share Christian values. We we all are walking the way, maybe with some nuances, but we all have the same focus and destination in mind, and we want to have Jesus at the center. You know, in many ways, every time this week comes up, I think of my childhood, which was a childhood of Christian unity. Mm-hmm. My father was a Methodist. My mom was Catholic. My mom, I know, prayed all the time for my dad to become a Catholic. My dad supported us went to Mass with us. We always sat in the first pew. He sang. He was involved in the liturgy, but he never received communion until one day when I was 16, I remember coming home from school, and my dad said to all of us kids, look, I want you all to get dressed up because we're going out to dinner, but we have a stop to make. Well, lo and behold, we went to our parish church, and this was before the rite of Christian initiation of adults. Unbeknownst to us, he had been working with our pastor, and he was welcomed into the faith that evening and went on to become one of the greatest Catholics. But our journey, our childhood journey, really, I think, mirrored what this week is all about, about working together. And, and we respected my dad's roots. He respected our roots. Yeah. I always like to think that when someone comes into the faith as a new Catholic, that they're loved into the church. There's something that draws them, whether it's in a marriage or engagement or other family members, but there's some some love connection that draws them into the faith. And I think that is so crucial to understand when we're talking about ecumenical attitudes and beliefs. And I think rightly so, the theme for this week of prayer for Christian unity comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 10, I think verse 27, you shall love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Those two commandments that Jesus shared with the lawyer who came forward and asked, how can I inherit eternal life? This is what you do. Why is that so important to love God and love our neighbor? That's how we get to heaven. St. John of the Cross once said, in the evening of our lives, we will be examined in love. I think we're going to be examined by how much we loved or how we failed to love. Mm -hmm. And that means going outside of our fences, beyond the barriers. It means recognizing that there are people who are embracing that same call to love God and love neighbor. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're of a different tradition, but nonetheless, we're all doing that together. I'm reminded of a story that I I often tell. It's when uh, this person died and they they got to the pearly gates, St. Peter put them on a tour, and they walked down the corridor, and he said, well, here's, these are where the Methodists are, these are where the Presbyterians are, oh, here's the Lutherans, and then as he walked further down the hall, he whispered, and he said, shh, he said, these are where the Catholics are, because they think, and we got to whisper, because they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> it's a cute course, little story, sure. but it really reveals a mm-hmm, truth, mm-hmm. that we don't have a monopoly on God's love and God's grace. You know, so often before Vatican II, we were taught as Catholics that we do not go to a Protestant church. And what about the dilemma for Catholics who had a son or daughter who was marrying outside of the church? 
in that Protestant church and how difficult it was for them not to participate. And so, you know, we have to really look at the blessing that the Vatican Council has brought to us, but also our understanding of our unity with our Christian brothers and sisters in the faith. How important is that? It's very important. You know, when my parents were married, God rest both of their souls, my dad was not Catholic. And at that time, they could not get married in the church. They got married in the library of St. Augustine's Church in Lawrenceville the Pittsburgh section. But how that's changed is that, you know, with Vatican II, there are provisions where Protestants can come in and marry Catholics in a church. It's usually encouraged that there not be a mass, that it be a wedding service, because, you know, if we were to have a mass when it become time for Holy Communion, because of the way our faith is, the people who are not Catholic would not be able to receive. Mm -hmm. We would not want to put them in that position. So, you know, it's best that we focus on the unity and not the aspects of disunity. So I think that the church has come a long way in this regard and does what she can to support the the fact that there are couples who are in interfaith marriages. Mm -hmm. And I think if I look back on my earlier days as a priest, when we celebrated this week of prayer for Christian unity, I remember actually doing pulpit exchanges. I went to the local Lutheran church, and that Lutheran pastor came to the Catholic church. And so that particular weekend, we exchanged pulpits. And I'll never forget my homily in the Lutheran church. I started, and I believe it was Jesus turning water into wine. That was the gospel. And I remember highlighting the role of the Blessed Mother in that, where you had mentioned it before in in one of our podcasts, that she said, do what he tells you. And so before the homily started, I said, I'd like to welcome the Blessed Mother of God into the church today. And I talked about her very briefly and her role in our faith. And I'll never forget at the end of the service, when I was greeting the people coming out, one of the gentlemen parishioner there at the Lutheran Church says, you know, as soon as you started to talk about Mary, I shut my ears. I didn't want to hear it. But the more I listened to your homily and how you brought that into the gospel, then it made sense to me. So there's this sense that we all have to be open to hearing different things, understanding different traditions, being respectful of that. And I think we would be remiss with the folks that are with us if we didn't bring up your Episcopal motto, which if people do not understand now, it is that all may be one. What made you select that as your motto? Well, first of all, I never envisioned having to choose an Episcopal (laughs) motto. God is so full of surprises, and and every day I'm humbled to be a bishop and and so grateful to be the Bishop of Youngstown. But with regard to that motto, I had received the call from the Apostolic Nuncio just days after the presidential election. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, that was such a fractured, splintered, divided, mean-spirited time. And it didn't take long to say, for the Lord to lead me to these words, because we really were a nation that needed that unity. And we were a church at that time that needed unity. And our families need unity. So it was a no-brainer for me. Well, Bishop Bonner, certainly we are living by your motto, which is also the prayer of Jesus, that all may be one. And as we celebrate this week of prayer for Christian unity, we pray that that will be our motto in life, that we live that way. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Catholic Echo is the media arm of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown, and it seeks to inform and entertain Catholics in our six-county diocese by forging stronger connections to our parish communities and highlighting the many blessings of Catholic life in our region. If you have a story idea for the Catholic Echo magazine, podcast, or website, send an email to catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org. We'd love to hear your ideas. Please join Catholic Charities by helping to support the Warm Hearts for Warm Homes campaign, formerly known as Keep the Kids Warm. The Warm Heart for Warm Homes campaign helps to provide direct utility assistance to families with children, working poor adults, and older adults on fixed incomes. Last year, Catholic Charities agencies impacted thousands of people through utility assistant efforts. Unfortunately, This year, the need for heat and utility assistance continues to rise. 
Catholic Charities is asking for your help to make Warm Hearts for Warm Homes a success by giving to your local parish online at www.ccdoy.org or by calling Catholic Charities at 330-744-8451. Welcome back to our show. With me is Father Joe Whitmer, who is a retired priest of the Diocese of Youngstown and longtime ecumenical officer, now retired from that. But welcome to our show. Thank you, Father Corda. You know, what we're talking about today is ecumenical relations and interfaith relations and how important it is not only in the life of the church, but in our diocese in particular. One of the areas that both you and I have been involved with is the Lutheran Catholic Covenant Commission. And you were basically on the ground floor for that. Give us a little background into how that all started. On Reformation Sunday in 1999, the International Lutheran World Federation and the Vatican signed a joint document on the doctrine of justification. It basically said, whatever our churches spoke like in the 16th century, what they now express and believe Mm -hmm. is not church dividing, which Mm -hmm. was for both a very awesome kind of step. Mm -hmm. And then shortly thereafter, uh, a Lutheran layperson from the greater Youngstown area asked his bishop that maybe we could do something in the Mahoning Valley to affirm this great step because the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America Synod covers much more territory than greater Youngstown. Mm -hmm. So the bishop said, good to that and set up a meeting then with Bishop Tobin, the two ecumenical officers, this Lutheran layperson and Monsignor Sifrin. And over lunch, uh, the Lutheran bishop made this request that we do something in the Youngstown area to acknowledge the step taken in 1999 Mm -hmm. at the international level. Bishop Tobin spontaneously responded and he said, I think that's a beautiful idea but I think we should go further. I think we ought to enter into a covenant with one another and commit ourselves to prayer, study, and action. And that was sort of an awesome step for a bishop to take. And so commission was set up with Lutherans and Catholics together in uh, certain responsibilities around the synod and around the diocese to come up with a plan as well as a covenant. The covenant was affirmed and then in, on Reformation Sunday in the year 2000, the signing of the covenant took place in a ceremony at uh, St. Columba Cathedral in the presence of both bishops, both signing, both speaking words of affirmation and encouragement to the synod and to the diocese to undertake this follow-up to the commitment. And of course, we're happy to say that that work continues today, going on 24, almost 25 years, celebrating how the Catholic Church and the Lutheran community comes together to pray, to study, to act, and how important that is, not only in the life of of our uh, local churches, but I think in the life of the church in general. Why is it important for us to be ecumenical. And what does that word ecumenical mean? Of course, oikomene means the, the whole inhabited earth. And both of us, Lutherans and Catholics and others, affirm that the gospel is for all peoples around the world. And missionaries have gone since the first century to different places and preaching the good news of the gospel. Of course, you were involved for many years as the ecumenical officer, and you worked in Washington, D.C. with the Catholic Conference of Bishops. Talk about that early experience that you had in ecumenical affairs and how moving it was for you. I was inclined to get involved ecumenically from the day I was ordained. Mm -hmm. Reported to my first assignment and asked the pastor if there's an ecumenical um, clergy association in Greater Youngstown, and he said yes. And he said, call this particular priest, who was a Byzantine priest, 
And I did, and he said, well, we're off for the summer, but as soon as we get together again in September, I'll give you a call and we'll go. And so we did. Interesting meeting. Towards the end of it, the, the person in the chair said, now we need to select a new secretary for this organization. Is anybody willing to do it? Silence. <laughs> he repeated his request. At the third one, I sheepishly raised my hand and I said, what's a secretary do? And he said he sends out postcards to let people know where we're going to meet and when. And I said, well, we have a parish secretary that can do that. I'd be willing. Mm-hmm. They said, fine. Then I found out that was the only officer there was. <laughs> so I was thrown into the mix. Mm-hmm. And in those years, the, the late 60s, the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity was very popular around the Christian community in the aftermath of Vatican II. And we used to have in Greater Youngstown three celebrations, one on January 18th, the first day of the week of prayer, one on the 25th, the last, and then the Sunday in between. Mm -hmm. And we decided to be very deliberate, having one location of prayer, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, Mm -hmm. and one speaker, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, but not in their own Mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. So trying to put that together was an interesting dynamic and I wound up being the Catholic preacher, and it was interesting and, for me, scary, because the whole facet of ecumenism was rather new to everybody in the, those days, most people, at least locally, but it wound up being a very good thing that had, obviously, great consequences for me. Your long-time involvement in ecumenical affairs and in interfaith relations has really brought you into contact with many people of different faiths. What has that done for you personally in your own spirituality? It has certainly encouraged me to think of the different ways that different facets of the Christian tradition are embodied in the different traditions. Even up to the present day, I remember the ecumenical patriarch making an expression about care for the creation. And of course, Pope Francis, by his encyclical Laudato Si, has affirmed that for Catholics, and many have taken great efforts to try to advance that. And even in the history, in the Catholic Church, there's been an emphasis on primacy. In the Orthodox tradition, an emphasis on synodality. With this development of a three-year process of synodality, makes a good advance to say, Maybe there's something to learn and maybe embody for us that will be advantageous. Well, Father Joe Whitmer, thank you for your long time teaching and learning and also encouraging ecumenical affairs and relations here in the Diocese of Youngstown and beyond, and we certainly appreciate that very much. Stay with us. We need to take a break. We'll be back in a moment. Did you know that the Catholic Echo magazine is delivered 10 times per year to 52,000 Catholic households in Northeastern Ohio? That's more than 150,000 people. In the Catholic Echo website, catholicecho.org, has been averaging 30,000 views per month since it launched in February, 2023. Advertise your business, special event, or service with the Catholic Echo in print or online. Email catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org. Advertising discounts are available for Catholic institutions, as well as for businesses that commit to five or ten issues in a year. Email catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org or visit the Advertising tab at catholicecho.org for more information. If you have a story idea for the Catholic Echo magazine, podcast, or website, send an email to catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org. We'd love to hear your ideas. With me is Justin Hike. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Father. It's good to be here. The Lutheran Catholic Covenant Commission. That's been in existence for a long time. We're celebrating a significant anniversary for that. If 
you could tell the folks about that. Absolutely. You know, the Lutheran Catholic Covenant is a particular expression of the ecumenical movement. And really, a lot of the movement flows from the 1999 agreement on uh, how we understand, we often talk about justification, but how do we understand God's saving activity in our lives and in our world? And there was, you know, a long time that we saw sort of a division between faith and works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Catholics and the Lutherans got together, the Vatican and the Lutheran body, to talk about how look, God's action's always first. You know, God saves us and works in our lives through grace. And then we respond to that in how we live. And even though there may be some distinctions about the language we use, that basic pattern is always there. And so this year, 2024, is the 25th anniversary of that statement. And then next year, 2025, will be the 25th anniversary of our local covenant between the Diocese of Youngstown and the Northeastern Ohio Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So it's a really exciting time. What I'd like to do is kind of take some steps back and us talk about parish involvement. Before you became Director of Communications for the Diocese, you worked in parish life. And in particular, the parish that you were in was involved with ecumenical and interfaith activity. How important is it for parishes, Catholic parishes, to be open to that ecumenical dialogue? And what can they do to further that? Absolutely. Yeah, we live ecumenism, how we relate to other Christians, really at the local level. And Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we put that to the side of our parish life. But it's not to the side of our actual lives. You know, we relate to folks, other Christians, um, all the time in the grocery store, on school boards, when we're cheering for our kids at soccer games. You know, we are together as community, and yet then we separate ourselves across churches. So one of the things we did when I was at St. Michael the Archangel is in Canton is that we really made an effort to really connect with what the diocese and the synod were trying to do in bringing Lutherans and Catholics together for prayer, and to at least make people aware of that, and then Mm -hmm. to go pray together. One way that this has really lived out, it's lived out in how we pray together, it's lived out in how we talk about theological things, Mm -hmm. but it's also lived out in how we serve together. So I'm very excited when I see parishes like St. Michael's and others in Stark County who are working together with other Christian communities and in a religious one, you know, across religions, on things like Habitat for Humanity, serving together, making a difference in the community because we do that together. When I was there, we worked together on this Thanksgiving Baskets project that, you know, instead of us giving out Thanksgiving, you know, baskets in each of our churches to the community, that we would do it together. And so we work together on those types of projects. I think what I'd like to do is kind of focus on one of the things that you said, and that's working together, and that's working on common things, things that we all believe together. And isn't that really crucial that we first take a look at what unites us before we start talking about what divides us? And how important is that to to look at those commonalities. Absolutely. Sometimes we forget that we are one family through our baptism. In Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, we hear that we share one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And this has been emphasized again and again by the church, by all the churches. My own family, you know, I have Methodists in my family and Catholics, but we are united in our baptism. And Jesus gave us a mission together. We don't have sort of a Catholic mission and a Methodist mission and a Lutheran mission. We have the mission of Jesus Christ. Yes, we know that we have uh, different ways of understanding, you know, for example, ministry and the priesthood, and, and those are important things. And even Eucharist, there's, you know, we, we know that's a huge issue that sometimes we focus on as a division. But we sometimes forget that, you know, even Eucharist is the bringing together of the many grains that become one loaf. So even though we have separations, we have a commonality in our baptism and in our mission. And I think even the slow work of how we come together is itself a witness to a divided world. You know, as you were talking, one thing that came to my mind is that that's really the mission of Jesus. And his great prayer was that all may be one. 
you know, oftentimes for us as, as Catholics and other Christians, we think that his great prayer was the Our Father. Well, sure, Jesus gave us the Our Father, but yet his great prayer, his final prayer to the Father in John 17 is that all may be one. And we're certainly striving for that here in the Diocese of Youngstown, and we've been doing that for many years. Let's also talk about some of our relationships with other Christian denominations and the Jewish community and how important those relationships are as well. And again, I think we see that in concrete ways in how we relate to one another in actual parishes and in actual congregations. When I was in Canton, one of the fruits of the Lutheran Catholic covenant for me. Remember, covenant mm-hmm. Covenant is not simply like we get together and we talk. Mm-hmm. I mean, dialogue is important, but covenant means that we are making a commitment to one another, and it's got deep biblical roots. Mm-hmm. And one of the people I got to talk with and meet with when we were in Canton is Pastor Darla Ann Kratzer, who has since moved on to another state. But she hosted our prayer service one year at her Lutheran church. And then a few months later, she brought some of her community members to the Easter Vigil to celebrate these new Christians who were coming into our common family. Mm -hmm. So they were not just becoming Catholic. She saw it as they're coming into my family as well, Mm -hmm. that one-on-one. The same thing is true about connecting with for example, the Jewish community, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, the Jewish community in Canton has been really involved with that Thanksgiving Baskets project and other projects, Mm -hmm. and we can't do it without one another. We can't live our faith, whatever our faith is, in a witness to the world without drawing on the strengths and the gifts and the passions of one another. If the folks that are with us would like some more information on how they can learn more about ecumenism, and in particular, the Lutheran Catholic Covenant. Uh, What can they do? Where do they go? So we would welcome folks becoming more involved with the Lutheran Catholic Covenant. We have a covenant commission, but the covenant involves all of us. And so I would encourage folks to look at doy.org for information about what's coming up with the Lutheran Catholic Covenant, and to pay attention to their bulletins and their announcements when these things are mentioned, because there are real concrete invitations to get involved with this covenant. And I think finally, for the folks that are with us, as you had mentioned before, every one of us has relationships with other Christians in our families, in our neighborhoods, and so it's important for us to really come together so that we all may be one. And as the church in the Diocese of Youngstown celebrates those significant anniversaries, whether it's the Jewish Christian Dialogues, whether it's the Lutheran Catholic Covenant Commission, or the St. John Chrysostom Society, whichever one uh, we participate in, that they are aware of that. And if they would like more information, they certainly can go to catholicecho.org. The Catholic Echo Podcast is a production of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Youngstown in cooperation with Cumulus Media Youngstown. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Have a blessed day, and may God be with you.